well, we can take one or two questions. Thanks very much for three very interesting uh, presentations. I want to just take up a piece from the last one with you, um, and that is a connection to sustainability. And the question is, do crypto, do you think that cryptocurrencies provide us with a way to address the question of externalities and by linking to real goods and ecosystem services? This has been suggested actually originally by a few years ago, and I can't remember now his name, but the, the um, governor of the Bank of China, Central Bank of China, that there should be a direct link, not cryptocurrency, but he suggested in a more general way, um, to uh, resource access. And my question is, it seems to me that this may be a way to directly tie it more broadly to a, um, a set of resources and the access to them that basically then addresses this question of ex externalities. It's interesting that this came from the governor of the Bank of China because obviously in China most of this is banned and it's called a uh, fraudulent and illegal financing activity. Um, look, there's lots of philosophical discussions that you can have about cryptocurrencies and token sales and actually a lot of um, what we're seeing is in this, not just in the commercial space, I mean that's the space I'm in, but also in this sustainability, green finance, um, where one, some of my colleagues in Singapore are working on a project in Africa that's um, got sort of token issuances linked to the provision of electricity to rural areas. So I think you're right, or whoever made the comment, there's, there's a lot more we can do in that ecosystem. I think a lot of the the, the really utility linked, oh, excuse me, um, where you can use this really as a, as a kind of force for good, you're, you're issuing tokens that can be used in an ecosystem to exchange goods, to exchange services, to, to, to buy and sell things essentially. Yeah. Yes, any more questions? I need some advice. <laughs> um, two things. I have grandchildren and stepchildren ranging from 12 to 22. And they're all very much into this. But at the craft conference at IASC a couple of months ago, we heard a Slovakian um, city manager say that the Slovakian cities of the future were going to be stuffed full of happy, smiling workers that were mostly young people drawn to those cities by the promise of free government subsidized Wi-Fi connections. And that did not sound like my grandchildren and, and children. And so I was wondering if, if you might, it's mar marginally connected, it's more connected to Douglas Adams and the age bracket, but the, the issue of the millennials' attitude about privacy and more traditional views about that. Actually, it's interesting because the, the millennials are the ones who are sort of now moving back into the, the anti-Facebook. And I'm not a millennial. I'm probably older than I look. Um, uh, so, you, you know, you, you're right. I never joined Facebook because I saw immediately that this was a recipe for disaster in terms of personal data. Um, this is a massively growing area for lawyers. Um, cyber attacks, uh, the, I don't know if you read um, a couple of weeks ago, Cathay Pacific, which is the flagship Hong Kong airline, um, disclosed the personal data of 9 million customers. Uh, look, I think we, 
in this particular area, we're doing the millennials a disservice because they're much more aware of the personal data and how it's being used or misused by these types of the, the new digital economy than perhaps the sort of half a generation up. Um, there's other issues with the millennials that I won't get into, but I, I, I think that's an area that's very much in, in, their, in their consciousness. I don't know if that answers your question. Bella, just for you first, I assume this conversation is going to continue after coffee as well. Yes. Right, good. So I, I'll then stay where we are at the moment. Um, three things around it. I, I know Christine's view on this, and it's precautionary. Um, in other words, from the IMF's perspective, the IMF's got to play, because if it doesn't, then there isn't an overall regulatory framework within which anything else um, can, can function. Um, and as you know, in respect of the debate around where the next financial crisis is going to come from, the IMF's overall posture in respect of this is that it's not likely to come out of traditional banking for a whole variety of relatively technical reasons. It's likely to come out of shadow banking spaces, but the fundamental thing is going to be essentially under-regulated areas with the potential for contamination. And the rest of what I think you very correctly represented is that this probably doesn't pose any fundamental threat at the moment, largely because it's broadly a walled space and it doesn't have significant overlap in respect of um, other financial flows. But as a challenge, and it's not a, a, a for or against this in any shape or form whatever, self-evidently there's going to be large-scale technological disruption taking place and the financial sector is ripe for it. FinTech is growing left, right and center. Your Kenyan farmer, by the way, has a peso already. He doesn't actually need Bitcoin, but, but that's neither here nor there. The fundamental thing is, given what we had, if you go back to the rationale that was being offered, for why the new economy in 99 and 2000 was going to operate according to fundamentally different rules to the old economy. And hence, non-profitable companies with no balance sheets in the tech sector were likely to be highly valuable. Why isn't this another example of the same? Uh, in other words, is the underlying rationale sound enough to not have a significant winnowing of the sector. Google, Apple, and half a dozen others became not unicorns, but spectacular successes with trillion dollar valuations, and 98.7% or more of the dot-coms disappeared. Do you think that's likely to be happening in this space, or what do you think is gonna be happening? You're living at the curl face in respect to this. What do you think is likely to be happening? Wow, if I knew what was happening in fintech in a week, wow. Um, look, I th as I said, I think initially there was such an enthusiasm, people were throwing money at things and people also had a lot of money because they made a lot of money in Bitcoin. That's all kind of slowing down now. And interestingly, so the Hong Kong regulator, the, uh, the SFC, has uh, released a paper to say we're, we're looking at regulating cryptocurrency exchanges. And one of the things that they said was, well, if we do regulate you, it's on an opt-in basis, and you have to list one token that, class, uh, that qualifies as a traditional security. And if you're listing tokens that have been issued as a result of an ICO, we want to see 12 months of track record. So. This is, they're doing it carefully this time around. And to sort of elevate this industry into a more professional space. So I think that's the difference, one of the differences to the sort of cowboy mentality. Um, and you can also see it at the conferences, at the FinTech type conferences, you know, the first couple of years with all the big ideas. And now, actually, things are coming to market in, in quite an amazing way. I mean, the, what I always laugh about is that um, 
everyone says that Bitcoin is all money laundering. I mean, if you look at the properly run fintech companies, exchanges, your AML, your KYC, you know your customer, is according to facial recognition. None of the banks are doing this, the traditional banks. So actually, the risks of a well-run exchange are lower than in the traditional banking sector. So what I'd like to see is more and more of these proper players coming into the market. And this is where, where we get involved, because it's only people who recognize this who are willing to come to a firm like mine and get proper advice. And the regulators are seeing this. And, and, and thankfully, we've got some forward-thinking regulators, particularly in Asia. But actually, UK is also pretty good, who are seeing that they have to play. The IMF sees this. Um, they play cautiously. And they come up with the right rules, Technolog technologically agnostic, um, but also cognizant of what's actually going on in the market. Ilan? Oh, OK. Quick last comment. I just want to tie this actually back to the two very interesting discussions of democracy, because I think that the issue, in a way, that it highlights is this very difficult exchange or balancing act between the privacy on one sense that we're used to of anonymity in a certain sense and the need in a democratic pr process to protect the democracy itself from that anonymity there is a there is in my mind a very difficult but crucial question here of how we do that and yes, you can use facial recognition. You have this going on in many places. And it is viewed with a great deal of distrust. And yet, it is very hard to see in a long-term relationship, if we think about how this goes forward, how we will avoid this. But then the question is, if we can't avoid it, how do we make the change useful? in a democratic sense. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, please uh, don't run away. Uh, we, we see each other back here. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it, it's a very tough question. Um, give you two uh, completely different ways in which I respond to that. I mean, uh, one of my banks, uh, in fact, my salary bank in, in Turkey has facial recognition. Um, and it is very useful because uh, I can walk into any branch and uh, demand any currency, particularly if I just look in my pocket and I, I'm just about to board a plane, I need British pounds, I just walk the guy, he doesn't ask any identification, he just sees who I am if I know my uh, 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 number, uh, account number. Uh, the, on the other hand, uh, there is high tech available to all uh, institutions of the state. Then you get queasy about it, particularly when, when high tech is applied. Uh, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of difficulty storing enormous amounts of data. And uh, if uh, they can go back 10 years, to find something in your telephone conversations. They can monitor all telephone conversations, but if they want to get back at you, they can recall your conversations. That's one. Number two is that I do get queasy when at one uh, button, the all my 
credit card transactions over, I think, 10 to 12 years can be recalled <clears throat> not only by criminal investigators, but all of, of states, uh, states' institutions. So, in a way, the question is, what kind of a state it is? I mean, <laughs> how do you get legitimacy? I mean, that was one of the questions we can come back to. I mean, populism is maybe not a regime, but is a way of legitimating authoritarian regimes. It is, it is not a regime itself. No? It's, a, it's a way, yeah. I think a very, very interesting question you raised. Um, I was talking very briefly. I was talking about effectiveness, uh, state capacity, uh, being in control of things that can uh, affect both the formation of the political will, I mean, all kinds of fake news and, and so, and can uh, hinder or facilitate the implementation of those two state functions that I've mentioned, right? And uh, I, I, but that is a matter of debate and this debate is only just now starting. Uh, I would be very open-minded towards uh, uh, saying that the state does not just need taxes and the proper staffing of executive positions through people who are both competent and immune to corruption, but the state needs also information. And uh, I mean, the, the whole debate on on uh, on uh, taxation and how uh, uh, I mean, many players escape their duty to pay taxes or proper taxes, and the comp tax competition among states, and, and so this all encourages me for the moment, maybe after an hour of discussion, I think differently, uh, to, uh, to uh, be fairly liberal uh, uh, in the sense of uh, granting states access to uh, information, to data that they need in order to perform their functions.